Thanks, everybody. Uh, and um, great start so far. I want to introduce Jeff Morrison, who is, uh, as everybody knows, Vice President of Global Purchasing and Supply Chain. He's responsible for uh, only about $75 billion in purchasing a year, and, and GM's about 13,000 suppliers. So probably a few people in this room have uh, worked with GM in the past. Um, as G Mary Barra you know, has said, you know, this is arguably the most transformative time in the auto industry. Um, before we get to the IRA and some of the, the challenges, can you talk about, just kind of in broad strokes, how GM is moving to this all-electric future and shifting the supply chain away from internal combustion vehicles to, mm. to a battery electric? Yeah, abso absolutely. I, so I, um, I also agree with Mary. I think it's, it's the most disruptive time I can ever think of um, in the automotive industry, and it's not even close. You know, and um, big trends in terms of moving from ice, you know, ice propulsion to electric. Um, obviously, we'll talk a lot about uh, the move to automated driving, really um, happening in steps and increments, um, all the way up to fully kind of robo taxi automated driving, which is really, really exciting. Requires a completely different level of sensing technology and compute power within the vehicle. And then, as you think about compute power moving to more software-defined vehicles. Um, so our complete electrical architecture that exists in the vehicles today is going through a transformation, you know, first from, from what it was to um, uh, being able to be updated over the air to now this future state of, of more centralized compute that has um, a lot more connectivity on and off the vehicle. And, and um, you know, each of these areas, I think, is, from, from a purchasing and supply chain standpoint, really exciting because it's, it's working really closely with our engineering partners on what it is that we're trying to do, and then with our suppliers, how do we how do we identify those partners for the future, and how do we work to transition uh, with them together going forward? And it's uh, it's it's not not a uh, not an easy day <laughs> ever. When you think about the shift to EVs, we have three big buckets, right? You have batteries. Uh, you've got um, you know electronics and electric motors, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are, what are the challenges in in sort of reshoring the supply chains for each of those? So, um, you know, from a battery standpoint, uh, we have we've been doing electric vehicles for a number of years, and LG um, Energy Solutions been you know our key partner for us. You know, so we started in 2019 with the strategy of um, as as we were. Um, uh, starting with the Ultium platform, the scalable kind of platform that we can do all these different vehicles on, um, we wanted to make sure that we were manufacturing the battery cells here. And uh, I, uh, one of our, we had two motivations really. I mean, one is we know that the cost is um, is going to be really challenging, and that we need to we need to drive that relentlessly um, to be able to offer customers um, uh, low low cost vehicles and. Um, their ability to actually scale and industrialize mm -hmm. in this environment where it's not just us, but it's many other customers uh, around the world that they're trying to do uh, the same with. So we really said that's strategic and we've got to make sure that we're um, partnered and really helping them and that we're intentional about that. Um, with the battery cell obviously goes all of the other components that make up the battery pack, which, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's components today that, if I think about some of the thermal, um, you know, thermal mitigation and, sure. and, and management systems that are in the bat. These are um, parts that have actually never been scaled and industrialized to do the volumes that we're talking about. And so um, that's one big area that we think about. I think on um, power electronics and maybe inverters specifically, mm -hmm. um, looking at a footprint and supply base today that um, needs to evolve. And so we're, we're working on how do we, um, how do we launch with those partners? But then, um, as the technology changes, and I think you know, we like many others are are seeing an opportunity moving from you know silicon semiconductors, IGBTs that are in mm -hmm. vehicles today, into more silicon carbide MOSFETs, um, which you know needs to be industrialized, needs to be scaled. So we've announced a lot of partnerships there. So it's kind of the second tranche, and then the third is really in the EV motors, um, and so we use um, uh, we use uh, permanent magnet motors for the most part. I mean, we have some induction motors, but, um, and these require um, rare earth magnets, which we know today and um, is, again, a very um, uh, dependent 
<laughs> location dependent right. um, commodity for us, right? And so um, we've done a lot of work with partners to, um, to localize and create um, investment and capacity here in the US for, for rare earths. And uh, we've announced partnerships to actually um, produce magnets here as well, so. Right. So, so as John Podesta mentioned, you know, much of, you know, the world's battery production is in China, as well as the, the, the critical minerals that are used to, to build those today. Um, we're obviously waiting the guidance from Treasury expected on Friday. But what, what do you see as sort of the, the big challenges to shifting that supply chain on the, the critical mineral side and then on the components as well? So we, um, and, and it was great, you know, listening to the comments at the dinner last night and, and you know, um, John Podesta's comments here this morning, it's, uh, it's completely aligned with what we're trying to do. And the way I describe it to people is, um, you know, we, we had this strategy probably a year or a year and a half before the IRA came out. So we, we knew that um, the capacity that we needed wasn't there. We had to build new capacity and we wanted to have a more resilient, sustainable, value chain that was feeding it than what exists today. So we were already on the path of how do we look at all the critical minerals and all the, all the chemical processing that's required to make battery cell components and battery cells and how do we, um, how do we re-footprint that, right? And we were looking largely at allied countries that, that are, are included in the IRA today. So when the IRA came out, it was, it was nothing but wind in our sails, right? It was, it was completely aligned with what we're doing. So I feel like we had a running start to it. Um, it doesn't make it any less challenging, right? So the, the challenge is really how do, you, how do you pick the right partners and then how do you execute as fast as you possibly can to, to get there with what ends up being major industrialization projects um, to do things like cathode active material, um, sulfating plants for conversion of nickel, manganese, um, cobalt hydroxide conversion plants for um, converting lithium carbonates, which we mainly buy today, right. um, into that. And then, um, and, and, and precursor plants and recycling plants and um, anode plants. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, then we looked at it and said, for each of these, we also need to make sure that we secure the feedstock. And so going all the way back to the mines and working on right. sources of lithium, sources of nickel, um, sources of cobalt, and um, it, it's, it's been a big challenge just in terms of the magnitude of it and the speed that we're trying to go. Yeah, bef uh, before we get to the IRA, I wanted to ask you about lithium, because GM has announced a couple of major um, um, agreements for U.S. lithium production, right, with uh, the Salton Sea and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. CTR and Thacker Pass. Um, what's, can you talk about how you thought about those deals and how you sort of can think about the environmental concerns? Yeah, I think... Um, I, on all deals, and I would say it's very cultural within um, personally. Sorry, so that wasn't me, I hope. Woo, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, very cultural within purchasing and supply chain and, and even within GM. Um, it starts with partnership, mm -hmm. right? So as we look at lithium, we've got a universe of, of companies that are approaching us and we're approaching to, to look at partnerships. And one of the first things we're trying to assess is, is this a is this a partner that we think um, uh, is seeking a win-win type of partnership, mm -hmm. right? And um, I, I won't give you names, but I can give you examples of um, people that have approached us with a much more opportunistic um, tone to their voice. So, you know, we've tried to understand what do they need, what do we need, and how do we collectively do that together? And so, um, both of these projects are, are different, but they're both um, large in scale, so they start with like great leaders, great partners at both. Um, they're, uh, they're companies that require um, some co-investment, some support, um, equity to, to get going. Um, they're looking for secure offtake, um, which we can provide. And we know that if you, if you reverse two years ago to the market prices for lithium at $7,000 or whatever it was, it's not, it's not at a level that's really viable to create new capacity or sustain it. So this idea of floor pricing, I think, is really important for our, um, um, for our partners. Likewise, um, there is no economic model that exists today that says lithium should cost $70,000, right? It's, right? it's completely absurd. And um, 
so we also want to make sure as partners that we're not paying 70,000, you know, so right. I think this, this floor ceiling ish type of mechanism, I think is really important for what we're doing. Mm. Um, we're trying to make EVs affordable and great for customers. We'd like to make money. We'd like our partners to make money. Um, I'd rather not have speculators or, or, sure. or others, you know, uh, making the money in this right. industry. Right. And so, um, uh, but two two absolutely great companies that I think um, offer a lot. So let, let's talk about the two halves of the IRA guidance that we're going to get this Friday, right? So the first is on the battery component side, right? That requires 50% of the value to be as produced in North America. The other is the critical minerals. That's a 40% from, you know, country like the U.S. or countries that the U.S. has a free trade agreement. How... How sort of doable is that going to be, do you think, in terms of initially for the industry? And do you think, you know, when you look at the GM footprint of vehicles currently getting tax credits, do you think, do you think some of those vehicles will initially get dropped to 3750 or won't get credits at all? Yeah. So we're, um, we're anxious, like everybody, I think, to see the final, you know, <laughs> the, the final um, rulings that, that kind of come forward here. Uh, you know, we've seen the white papers. I think we have a pretty good idea of directionally where it's, where it's heading. Um, we are... We are very optimistic that um, we're going to be in a position to qualify um, fully for the for the tax incentives and credits sure. um, starting now and throughout. But obviously, there's some some, some work that we need to do, and it's sure. going to depend on that final ruling that comes out. Um, I think of it in terms of three phases of what we're trying to industrialize. So we've got we've got today, right, which which really is reliant on the footprint that exists, and um, we're going to launch and we're going to start. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're going to start launching and growing our battery cell and battery production here in North America. So that's that's good. Um, but we're going to really be reliant from the critical mineral value chain that exists today, right? Um, the second phase is we'll start to um, we'll start to move uh, components of that out of foreign entities of concern into right. into more kind of French shored locations. Sure. Um, we think that gets us through kind of calendar year 25. Um, gets us the first million EVs that we've talked about pretty publicly. Right. And then really a lot of this new capacity, like the two mines that you're talking about, you know, in, in, um, uh, for lithium, yeah. a lot of the other deals that we've announced, um, this starts to then create, and, and um, our, our CAM joint venture that we have uh, with POSCO in Canada, right. um, LG is committed to, um, to opening a CAM facility here in, in uh, uh, likely the U.S., um, uh, this will this will provide the capacity that will get us the next million. That's kind of that mm -hmm. twenty six to thirty time frame. Right. How challenging is it going to be to meet those ten percent yearly um, increases? Those those two base numbers keep going up annually. Yeah, and so I think you know we we've got a team that's really modeled that out, and it aligns largely with you know the the timing of a lot of the deals and mm -hmm. when that capacity starts to right. come online and. Um, I, to, to do all these, I mean, as you can imagine, we've announced uh, at least a dozen deals. Um, right. These are large, complex, difficult deals. I think one of the one of the things that we did early on, um, recognizing the need to be able to go fast on these, was right. we created we created a super team within the company, you know, <laughs> of procurement experts, um, corp dev, you know, M and A experts, finance experts, policy and government relations right. experts to really kind of um, help map this out and right. to uh, once we've once we know what we want and we've identified partners be able to move fast and, and go and so that that same team has taken the work that they're doing and the pipeline of opportunities right. and they're overlaying it with what we believe that ramp in is going to finally look like and um, again I think we feel pretty confident that we've got a, a plan to achieve it you know we'll we'll hope for no surprises here <laughs> but, but you said a lot of it is really in the details right of what's in this guidance right in terms of the battery processing rules and what's a component versus what's a mineral. I mean, it sounds very technical, but it really could have a big impact on what these credits look like. It, it's important. I mean, I, I and I think we've tried to really understand what what the laws are trying to accomplish, right. um, which we think is completely aligned with what we're trying to do, sure. and we're hopeful that the rules will sure. will be consistent with that, right. right? And so that there's no no surprises to it. Obviously. Um, you'd hate to have rules come out that uh, one of our, th there, there is a cost to doing sure. what we're doing, right. right? And we hope over the long term that cost, um, you know, scales and, and comes down. Um, 
I would hate to see us, you know, taking on additional costs mm -hmm. um, and incentivizing maybe bad behavior of others <laughs> as the ruling comes out, right? Um, so, but you, you mentioned, that, you know, one of the big things you also have to do is manage your internal combustion business, right? Because obviously that accounts for the vast majority of GM's profits today. This is a business that you know, GM intends to exit, maybe you know, potentially by 2035. How do you how do you manage that business and suppliers that are going to be shifting toward EVs? At the same time, you, you face rising fuel efficiency requirements that require you to make those internal combustion vehicles more efficient, even as they will ultimately be, you will exit that business. Yeah, it's it's a really difficult balancing act right now, mm -hmm. right? So it's um, our our ICE vehicle profits are funding our EV future, right. and we've been very public um, about that, and it's it's the reality, right? right. Um, and so making sure that we uh, earn those profits and produce those vehicles is, is number one priority for me every single day, right? Um, over time, we know that volume starts to come down. I think there's a lot of debate about what that, what that ramp down curve looks like and what the ramp up curve looks like right. for vehicles it replaces. So our, um, our Altium platform uh, is scalable all the way from small SUVs all the way up to full-size trucks. So we mm -hmm. can do single layer, double layer packs. So we are in the EV truck business. I drive a Hummer, which, oh my God, is incredible, right? Um, but uh, we're, we're, in, we're in the EV truck business. So we want to we be cautious not to, not to be too aggressive with what we think the ramp down assumption is. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be too conservative with what we think the ramp up assumption right. is. So we're, there's this tendency to maybe you know, want to overcapacitize and work. You know, so right. it, it's a lot of very detailed, open, transparent discussions with suppliers about what we think this looks right. like, and then a lot of intentionality around the partners we have today on ICE, what does their future look like with EVs, and how do we manage that together, and um, you know, not all are, are involved in commodities and technologies that will be in EVs, right? right? And so um, those that aren't, we really you know, are having proactive discussions about how does that future look, and, mm -hmm. and how, do we, well, you know, how do we manage that together? Um, but we know that's going to be some challenges as we go forward in terms right. of suppliers are going to get into financial troubles. Uh, you know, we may have new owners that come in and buy pieces of the business right. or entire businesses that may not have the best intentions. Right. And so we, you know, um, we're on the lookout. And, and maybe we can sort of close with, you know, obviously during COVID, the industry was hit by the semiconductor shortage, right? And obviously everybody had to work through that and it cost an enormous amount of production. What what are the, are there certain areas in the supply chain for EVs that keep you up at night or you say to yourself, these are the areas that I'm really concerned that as, as the industry ramps up toward big EV numbers, that this is a choke point we need to be concerned about? I, I love the question and it's actually um, the, the lesson we learn from um, semiconductors is the importance of engaging deep into the value chain on right. critical components, right? And having the direct partnerships with the semiconductor suppliers. And, I hate the A word, right? I don't want to ever hear the word allocation <laughs> uttered ever again in my life, right? And so um, as you think about critical minerals and battery raw materials, mm -hmm. we want to be in a position, we control our destiny, we have the partnerships, we're engaged at that right level, and I never hear the A word, right? Because we've got security of supply that's coming and somebody's not looking at us as a transactional partner and saying, hey, I know I said I could do 50,000 tons out of this asset, I can only do 30,000, so you're gonna get a 60% allocation like everybody else. Like that, that will never fly. Right. Yeah. Right. Hey, well, please give Jeff a big round of applause and thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thanks. Well, thanks.